All right. Oye, oye, oye. Anyone having business for the King's Justice of the Superior Court of Justice, attend now and you shall be heard. Long live the King, the Honorable Justice Hennessy presiding. Please be seated. Good morning, all. Good morning, Justice Hennessy. Good morning. Oh, dear. In, in fact, I was going to begin by asking if everyone is on the internet, because we've been having a little bit of trouble. So, oh, maybe we could just take a minute. Right, we'll take a moment then. Thank you, Justice Hennessy. I want to start today by picking up on a question that you asked last day on Friday. My answer requires correction. It has to do with the allocation of liability as between Canada and Ontario. Yes. You asked me, how do you get to an award against Canada of 15% of the total compensation owed without a finding of joint liability. Specifically, what law do you apply? Sorry, and part of that question was, and it may have been you were speaking in the vernacular, part of it might have been Canada would be subsidizing Ontario. That was in the vernacular. That, that is correct. I had made that statement in the sense that I'm not proposing that Canada pay an additional award, but rather that Canada share in the award that Ontario will be paying. And, and in, in that way, I use the term subsidize. But really, uh, that's not really the right way to look at it. I'm, I'm, I'm submitting to you now. Um, because you had asked what law do you apply that would make, uh, to, in order to make an award against Canada, given that the resource revenues were Ontario's. And I told you that you don't need to make a finding of joint liability or joint and several liability in order to apportion liability. And I told you that you shouldn't make an order of joint and several liability in this case, because there is no authority for that in the public law context. And such a finding won't advance the ultimate resolution of the crown allocation issue. But you do have to find a legal basis for the apportionment of liability and that legal basis is found in the Grassy Narrows decision and in the Constitution. On Friday, I told you that the Constitution does not provide a basis for a finding of 15% liability against Canada. But I was thinking of Section 109. And in fact, that, that the Constitution effectively says that the liability rests with the emanation of the Crown, which collects the revenues. Again, that's from section 109. But there are other relevant provisions of the constitution for this question that do provide a basis for the apportionment of liability and for a finding that Canada should bear a portion of the total award of compensation, should bear liability for a portion of the total award to reflect its breach of the duty to engage in a process to determine the net crown resource revenues. Specifically, 
Section 9124 of the Constitution has been relied on by my friends from Ontario and from the plaintiffs. Of course, we all know that's the provision of the Constitution which provides legislative authority to the Dominion for, quote, Indians and lands reserved for Indians. Canada does not admit that it is solely responsible for the treaty or annuity augmentations as a result of 9124. But Grassy Narrows tells us that each emanation of the Crown is responsible to implement treaty promises to the extent of their jurisdictional responsibilities under the division of powers. Ontario and the plaintiffs argue that Canada bears responsibility under section 9124 and Canada acknowledges this responsibility. I'd like to go through the assertions that the parties make about the significance of 9124. I'm going to summarize what they say in their written submissions, and I'll refer you to the specific paragraphs, which my colleague, Ms. Sang, will put on the screen if you'd like to refer to them, except that we're still having some technical difficulties. So I think that we can probably proceed, and um, if I give you the direction to the part of the written submissions, you'll know where to find them if you want to look at them. Thank you. Ontario says at paragraph 233 of its written submissions, that Canada, quote, assumed direct responsibility for treaty administration, close quote, under section 9124. It is true that Canada pays the annuities from an administrative point of view and has since 1867. This does not mean that Canada is responsible for funding the annuities. And in fact, Ontario and Quebec have funded the annuities up to $4 per person through the capitalization of the annuities in 1900. Is this the paymaster argument made by the plaintiffs? Or the paymaster role? I think that could be characterized that way, yes. Now I mentioned that uh, in fact, historically Ontario and Quebec have funded the annuities up to $4 per person as a result of the capitalization in 1900. I acknowledge that Ontario and Quebec at least partially funded them because through what I think we can call Ontario's hard bargaining, Canada accepted a lower amount for the capitalization than it might have. Nevertheless, the principle remains that under, at that time, the section 111, section 112 route it was Ontario and Quebec who were found liable to fund those annuities. Nevertheless, as I stated, Canada has paid the annuities from an administrative point of view since 1867. Ontario also says that paragraph 234 of its written submissions that Canada, quote, assumed jurisdiction for implementing the augmentation clause through 9124, close quote. This is true. Canada is responsible for implementing the augmentation clause, but not to the exclusion of Ontario. Both are responsible to implement the augmentation clause. The plaintiffs say at paragraph 577 of their written submissions that, quote, each crown is directly liable to the plaintiffs to fulfill all crown, obliga crown obligations required by the 1850 treaty to the extent that they possess jurisdictional authority under the Constitution Act 1867 to both facilitate and give effect to the treaty promise, close quote. This means that Canada has jurisdictional authority to meet with the First Nations, to discuss net crown resource revenues, and a responsibility, as I said the other day, to make diligent efforts to bring Ontario to the table. But Canada does not have jurisdictional authority to seize 
a portion of Ontario's net crown resource revenues and redirect them to the plaintiffs. Ontario is you said, uh, authority. You said authority does not have jurisdictional authority to seize and redirect those revenues. Ontario is directly liable to the First Nations for a share of Ontario's revenues. Canada refers to Grassy Narrows at paragraph 299 of our submissions with the acknowledgement that when any government exercises power, and that means any government in, in Canada exercises power, it is burdened by the Crown's obligations to Indigenous peoples. We cite from Grassy Narrows in our written submissions, and my friends uh, from the plaintiffs do as well. There are two paragraphs in particular that I want to quote from, and I think these propositions are so well known, it's not necessary to put them up on the screen. The first is in paragraph 30 of Grassy Narrows. Is it, it by chance in your materials? Yes, at, at uh, paragraph 299, there's two um, paragraphs I want to cite. Paragraph 30. In your submissions? No, I'm sorry, paragraph 299 in our submissions. But the paragraph of Grassy Narrows that I want to cite. Yes, it's paragraph 30. Is uh, paragraph 30 and paragraph 35. They're both in the compendium that you should have that paper spiral bound compendium yeah. at tab four. In the Supreme Court, the case was uh, titled Keewatin. Now, here's the same problem. In fact, um, in, in our submissions, we, we cite and quote from paragraph 35, but my friends, the White Sand Red Rock plaintiffs have also cited paragraph 30, and I'm, I'm gonna to refer to paragraph 30 as well. Paragraph 30, which is not in the compendium there, but it is in my friend's submission. It's a very simple proposition. It is repeated in paragraph 35, but the way it's expressed in paragraph 30 is, the level of government that exercises or performs the rights and obligations under the treaty is determined by the division of powers in the constitution. And then in paragraph 35, which is the paragraph you have in the compendium and in our submissions at 299, paragraph 35 tells us both levels of government are responsible for fulfilling these promises being treaty promises when acting within the division of powers under the Constitution Act. Canada goes on at paragraph 303 of our submissions to acknowledge that upon confederation, quote, responsibilities for treaty fulfillment were divided to align with federal or provincial administration and control of assets and revenues and authority under the constitution. That's paragraph 303 of our submission. At paragraphs 304 to 306, we go on to explain the other aspects, other sections of the Constitution Act that are relevant here. And in particular, not only 9124, but we note as well 92 and 92A. And they, 92A is, is reproduced there for you. 92 um, sub five is cited at paragraph 304 of our submissions. Section 92 sub five assigns exclusive legislative authority to Ontario to make laws in relation to, quote, the management and sale of the public lands belonging to the province and of the timber and wood thereon. 
And then section 92A, which we cite at paragraph 305, explains that in each province, the legislature may exclusively make laws in relation to, among other things, the development, conservation, and management of non-renewable natural resources and forestry resources in the province, et cetera, et cetera. Is non-renewable defined as, where do trees fit in non-renewable? Trees? Yeah. Well, it goes on to say, and forestry resources oh. in the province in the, same, in the same phrase. So we know that forestry is captured as well. Excuse me for a moment. I understand that we're, we're having a bit of a technical problem, which is that the host of the Zoom link has disabled screen sharing. So if we can get... So should we take a break? Your Honor, I believe I've fixed that. Pardon me? I believe I've fixed that right now. If they'd like to try again. Okay, we're good now. Thank you very much. Thank you. So Canada does acknowledge in our written submissions these other parts of the Constitution that are at play. Although we go on then in paragraph 307 to explain that the most relevant provisions are sections 109, 111, and 112, which are the ones we've been discussing. But I did want to acknowledge and point out the relevance of the division of powers provisions, including 9124, because in my submission, that is the law, as explained by the Supreme Court in Grassy Narrows, that you would apply in order to apportion liability between Canada and Ontario without having to resort to trying to fit it into the ill-fitting private law concept of joint and several liability. Now I should emphasize that, as I mentioned earlier, section 9124, which provides the dominion with legislative authority over, quote, Indians and lands reserved for Indians, close quote, does not make Canada liable for every breach of treaty or Aboriginal right, and certainly not to the exclusion of liability of the provinces. Here, the monetary loss was loss of a share of Ontario's resource revenues, and this must be compensated for by Ontario through section 109 and through sections 92 and 92A. The loss that Canada contributed to was the failure to engage in a process to determine net crown resource revenues this does not require a separate monetary award. As I submitted on Friday, Justice Hennessy, it is addressed through a declaration and also through the present value assessment of the monetary compensation. Before we go too much further on that, do you uh, submit there is any conflict in these sections? of the Constitution? I Section do not, 9124 and the Division of Powers? I do not see a conflict, Justice Hennessy. But the, the Dominion has legislative authority over Indians and, Indi and land reserved for Indians, which makes Canada liable for certain things. And the Division of Powers, so you're, you're not arguing that they are in conflict and there's some way to reconcile those. You say they both exist. They uh, provide a route to the finding of liability as you submit? Yes, I, I would submit that section 9124 does not uh, supersede any of the other parts of the division of powers set out in the constitution. There's nothing that makes the fact that it's the federal crowns division list in the, in the federal crowns list in section 91 that makes it more important or more significant or take precedence over the fact that it's that uh, other interests are listed in section 92 as part of provincial responsibilities. We know, of course, that the constitution needs to be read uh, 
with an understanding that there's going to be issues of overlap or sometimes gap. We, we see that in environmental law, for example, the constitution isn't going to answer every question in neat little categories. And it's not really intended to. The fact that the federal crown has legislative authority over Indians and lands reserves for Indians does not mean that anything that has to do with indigenous issues or treaties or Aboriginal law falls to the federal crown. That can't be right. And the Supreme Court tells us that in Grassy Narrows. Each crown is responsible for fulfilling their duties where they have authority under the division of powers. We must remember as well that both 91 and 92 are, are really lists or categories of items over which each respective government has legislative authority. Legislative authority should be read the way that it's expressed. It's each, each crown has authority to make legislation and enact legislation in relation to these topics, but this doesn't mean that they're, they have uh, an overarching responsibility over these um, categories. Still, it, 9124 and uh, 92 do provide a guide to help understand when we follow the Supreme Court's direction in Grassy Narrows, how do we divide up responsibility? The Division of Powers helps provide a guide to that. So I was saying that whereas Ontario is responsibility through sec is responsible for section through section 109 and 92 and 92A for the loss resulting from the failure to share resource revenues, Canada bears some of the liability for failing to engage in a process to determine the net crown resource revenues. And I submit that. Canada's liability there is only a, a portion, a smaller portion than Ontario's. Canada was, as I said in my opening, the junior partner here. Canada's share should be no more than 20%. And in fact, we suggest 15% because Ontario bears more liability since it was the party which had the resource revenues to be disclosed. And furthermore, Ontario benefited from holding the funds, which should have gone to the First Nations as part of the treaty promise. So as I explained earlier, part of Canada's liability would be on the basis that the failure to engage in a process to disclose net crown resource revenues caused some delay, in fact, significant delay, in the plaintiffs receiving their augmented annuities and that it is reasonable that Canada should bear some responsibility for that delay on the theory that if they had have been diligently implementing the treaty promise, at the very least, they would have made diligent efforts to bring Ontario to the table. So it's on this basis that I submitted that Canada should bear some liability for that um, time value of money effectively. But here you must remember that again, it's Ontario that bears the lion's share of this because it was Ontario that held, that benefited from holding the funds all those years. Thank you. I'd like to move on then to where we left off last time when we were actually going through in, in some detail the 1895 decision of the Supreme Court of Canada. We were looking at, in the annuities case, we were looking at uh, the, the preamble to that uh, reported decision because it, it includes lots of historical background, including the text of the various arbitrators' awards, which are relevant. So that's where I want to pick up again. And for that, I would ask that you turn up um, that Supreme Court case, which you can find in hard copy in our compendium at tab seven. But as I noted, uh, I'm going to refer the court to a number of passages that aren't sidebarred or highlighted in that 
paper version. So if you're interested in following along uh, with the electronic version, my colleague, Ms. Sang, will be sharing it on the screen and you'll be able to follow along with the highlights. Very nice, thank you. So just to resituate ourselves, we were we had started by going through the preamble where the uh, the relevant order from the section 142 arbitrators in 1870 was reproduced. And these were the arbitrators that were appointed pursuant to section 142 of the constitution to determine how to split the debt of the province of Canada as between Ontario and Quebec. And you'll remember that this particular award was made on the third day of September, 1870. And it's reproduced beginning at page 439 of the Supreme Court report. And my colleague has it on the screen here. We went over this the other day. There are two parts of this 1870 award that are important to keep in mind as we go through the history. The first part is the local benefit principle. And I had mentioned earlier that the September award does not actually spell out that the arbitrators are following the local benefit principle. Instead, they just divide the, the debts and liabilities on the basis of a mathematical calculation. But we know that this award comes out of the May 28th, 1870 award made by arbitrators McPherson and Gray. And the details of that are set out in our written submissions at paragraphs 333 and 335. We don't need to go to those now, but I had wanted to tell the court where you can find that background. But that, that's the first of two points that are relevant to keep in mind about this 1870 award, because we're going to come back to it. You'll see Ontario makes an argument about it. The first point, as I said, is that it, the division between Ontario and Quebec was made on the basis of the local benefit principle. The local benefit is the wording that was used by justices or arbitrators McPherson and Gray. And that, as I, I'm sure you know where I'm going with that, it's the same principle that we say um, is part of the common law and, and um, is consistent with both the common law of state succession and section 109. But the second part that's important in this 1870 award is the 13th clause, which is on page 440 of the reported case. And this is the provision whereby the arbitrators specified that all of the lands in either of the provinces shall be the absolute property of the province in which they are situated, free from any further claim upon or charge to the said province in which they are so situate by the other of the said provinces. And this is the key part, by the other of the said provinces. So to the extent that the section 142 arbitrators decided in 1870 that each province got the lands free and clear. That was only in respect of claims by the other province, by Quebec, for example. This does not speak about claims by the First Nations. Claims or interests? That's correct. Charge is the word they use. Now, skipping ahead 25 years, we know then in, in these intervening 25 years, the First Nations brought their claims to, the First Nations claims were heard by the Crown starting in about 1873 and processes were put into place whereby Canada increased the annuities up to $4 per person. Because remember before 1873, they weren't being paid even at $4 per person. Canada uh, agreed with Ontario that it would start paying $4 per person and Canada and Ontario agreed that they would dispute later whose responsibility would be. This carried on for some 20 years. And in 18, beginning in 1892, we start to see the orders of the arbitrators coming out dealing with this question. So the most, the, the award we need to take a look at is the third award of what I will call, and we called in our submissions, the, the Dominion Provincial Arbitrators. So you've got the section 142 arbitrators 25 years earlier, section 142, because they were dealing with that part of the constitution, 
The Dominion Provincial Arbitrators, we call them that because this was a dispute between the Dominion and Ontario and Quebec. And you might remember as well that this was not pursuant to the Constitution. This was pursuant to jointly enacted parallel uh, legislation that the, the governments agreed that this is how they would resolve their disputes. And starting at page 441, for example, part of the, uh, this joint enactment required that the arbitrators shall consist of three judges. And in fact, all of these arbitrators we'll hear about, Chancellor Boyd, Arbitrator Burbage, and Arbitrator Casso were all judges. So beginning on page 442, the report here reproduces the third award. And actually, if you, if you turn to page 443, you'll see the title there at the very top, Award on Indian Robinson Treaties, Huron and Superior, 13th February, 1895. This is where the award is reproduced. And the relevant portion I want to take you with starts on page 444. Now, therefore, this is halfway through the page. Now, therefore, the said arbitrators, et cetera, et cetera, do award, order, and adjudge. Number one, well, this is sort of section one. These are their orders in respect of the claim made by the Dominion against Ontario and Quebec with respect to these Robinson annuities. I should point out that these Dominion provincial arbitrators dealt with a number of other, other issues as well. So we're just looking at uh, part one of their order. So part one, clause one specifies that if, if in any year since the treaties in question were entered into, the territory thereby ceded produced an amount which would have enabled the government without incurring loss to pay the increased annuities thereby secured to the Indian tribes mentioned therein, then such tribes were entitled to such increase not exceeding $4 for each individual. And here, Justice Hennessy, I emphasize the word tribes because we spoke earlier about what was the party's understanding, the Crown understanding, the Crown understanding at the time. I submit to you it is apparent from the language of this arbitration award that these arbitrators understood that the obligation was to pay the tribes such an amount that would would equal $4 per person. So we see the same reference to $4 in the tribes in section two, that the total amount of annuities to be paid, the total amount of annuities to be paid under each treaty is in such case to be ascertained by reference to the number of Indians from time to time belonging to the tribes entitled, et cetera, Going on to 445, the annuities, if the revenues derived from the ceded territory permitted without incurring loss, were to be equal to a sum that would provide $4 for each Indian of the tribes entitled. So again, I'm referring the court to these passages to emphasize that these arbitrators understood what they were dealing with was an annuity obligation payable to the tribes, but equal to the sum that would provide $4 for each Indian, using that term as the arbitrators did. Now, the next paragraph that's uh, relevant and we have highlighted is, sub, is paragraph four. I'm sure someone's gonna find that on the floor. Let me just. Uh, okay, can we? Uh... Go ahead. 
thank you. I'm moving on to paragraph four of that, uh, the arbitrator's third award dated February 13th, 1895. Paragraph four specifies that any liability to pay the increased annuity in any year before the union, that is before 1867, was a debt or liability which devolved upon Canada, that being the Dominion, under the 100th and 11th section of the British North America Act. And that this is one of the matters to be taken into account in ascertaining the excess debt for which Ontario and Quebec are conjointly liable to the Dominion under section 112. This I think as well, well understood that before the union, that is any debts of the province of Canada existing at the union, which is exactly what section 111 tells us, debts and liabilities existing at the union in 1867 of the province of Canada are assumed by the Dominion with the Dominion's right to recoup from Ontario and Quebec under section 112. That is to recruit, recoup any amount in excess of the debt allowance. And we see here that we know that these annuities are in excess of the debt allowance. It says right there, one of the matters to be taken into account in ascertaining the excess of debt. This is part of the excess of debt. Now, interestingly, in paragraph four, the arbitrators go on to say that Ontario and Quebec have not in respect of any such liability being discharged by reason of the capitalization of the fixed annuities or because of anything in the Act of 1873. Now, first of all, the Act of 1873 was that increase in the debt allowance. So the arbitrators are saying it, it doesn't matter that the debt allowance was increased. This is still an excess debt that needs to be divided between Ontario and Quebec. And that, that Ontario, for which Ontario and Quebec are liable to recoup the Dominion. Or reimburse is the language we might use today, reimburse the Dominion. So just as a reminder, when they talk about here the fixed annuities, the capitalization of the fixed annuities, what they're referring to is the fixed annuities are the, in the Robinson Superior Treaty, it's the 500 pounds or $2,000. And you might remember that both treaties together, the fixed annuity was $4,400. $2,000 for the Superior Treaty, $2,400 for the Robinson Treaty. Together, $4,400. That amount was capitalized back in 1870. I think my friends took us to exactly when, but let's say effective in about 1870. And then the, their... Uh, a capitalized amount of $88,000 was paid by Ontario and Quebec. The 88,000 was the capitalization of the 4,400? Exactly, exactly. And I just want to remind you of that because you'll see later in these uh, reasons, the Supreme Court judges do refer to Ontario's argument that we're done with this. We already capitalized these annuities. And here we're seeing that no, the, that was a capitalization of the fixed annuities, which is something different from the augmented annuities. So I'd like to turn then to, we're still on the arbitrators, but now we have the benefit of reading the actual reasons of the arbitrators. And those start with the Chancellor, Chancellor Boyd on page 448 of the reported decision. We have uh, Chancellor Boyd's reasons. And you can see he succinctly states the question that's being determined here. Then arises the inquiry, does any interest in respect of these Indians attached to the lands belonging to Ontario under section 109? So the question is being framed as section 109 holds back, provides sort of a hold back of Ontario's uh, taking over of those lands and says that that's subject to any trust or other or, or interest other than that of the province. And the question here is, is there any interest in respect of these First Nations attaching to the lands that would qualify here? So Chancellor Boyd answers this question for himself on page 450. Now, this is a long passage, but it's very important. I think I will um, 
go through at least parts of it and you can follow along as I go. It starts with on the face of the treaty in 1850 are found indicia of generous intentions contemplated and liberal decisions and liberal dealings promised. Goes on to explain there are fixed annuities, then there's the augmentation provision. And he quotes from that augmentation provision and says what it means halfway through that paragraph. That is to say, if the rents, issues, and profits, whether from sales, leases, mining royalties, timber licenses, or other sources of revenue derived from the surrendered land shall yield a surplus after payment of all outlay in connection with the development and improvement of the territory, then that surplus shall go to augment the annuities from time to time. True, the mere words used do not say that the increased annuity is to be paid out of the proceeds of the land, but that is the plain and reasonable implication. He goes on to say at paragraph at page 452, making an analogy to an equitable doctrine. It appears to me that there is an implied obligation to pay the increased annuities out of the proceeds of the lands, which passes with the lands as a burden to be borne by Ontario. So Chancellor Boyd here is acknowledging that the language of the treaty doesn't say specifically that the augmented annuities are to come out of the proceeds of the lands, but that's implied. That's what is the plain and reasonable implication. So we'll skip ahead to Justice Arbitrator Casso. And we see Justice Casso's name more than once in this history, not that I think it's relevant, that, but he was the uh, counsel for Quebec in the 1870 Section 142 arbitrations. He now here is the uh, Quebec's appointee to the Dominion Provincial uh, Arbitration. And he agrees, I don't think we need to read uh, Justice Casso's reasons, which are very brief in comparison to the others, but he agrees that um, that for all the annuities, even the capitalization subsequent to Confederation, it should be borne by the province of Ontario. Justice or Arbitrator Casso's position was, this never should have been shared with Quebec in the first place. It, the whole thing should have been Ontario's. But nevertheless, he, he certainly agrees with Chancellor Boyd, or really on that basis, he agrees with Chancellor Boyd that these annuities uh, payable after Confederation are certainly to be paid by Ontario. Can you tell me what page I'm at? Uh, 455. And I didn't actually highlight this because I thought in the interest of time that we wouldn't go through the detail, but I just wanted to summarize that Casso is on the, the same uh, thinking as Boyd and Burbage. This is a unanimous decision of the arbitrators. Thank you. But I do want to go through Justice Burbage's reasons in some detail because he really does provide a very detailed analysis of the issues. And I want to start with page 456. I'm going to read a passage that you'll be familiar with because we've heard it many times. It starts with um, halfway through the page, I am of the opinion. And as to that, I do not know that there's any controversy between the parties that if the territories were to um, produce an amount which would enable to the, the government to increase the annuities. Then such tribes were entitled to such increase, not exceeding $4 for each individual. So much they were entitled to as a matter of law and right. Any increase beyond that would have been a matter of grace. And this isn't actually relevant to um, 
the, the reason I'm drawing this to your attention is because we've heard this phrase and I just wanted to remind you, this is where it comes from. Anything beyond $4 was a matter of grace in the view of the arbitrators at the time. That's, that's what their understanding of the treaty was at the time. I am further of the opinion that the total amount of annuity to be paid under each treaty is in such a case to be ascertained by reference to the number of Indians from time to time belonging to the tribes entitled to the benefit of the treaty. And he goes on carrying to the next page that the sum would be equal to a sum that would provide $4 for each Indian of the tribes entitled. And I just point this out, Justice Hennessy, because it's a, it reinforces that the arbitrators at the time were under the impression that the obligation was annuities payable to the tribes, that the total amount in the language of Justice Burbage was equal to what would be $4 for each member of the tribes entitled. And anything beyond that was a matter of grace. Again, just pointing out, this was the understanding of the treaty at the time. And because I think it does become relevant later when we talk about the purported release by Canada. Interestingly, um, you may remember from the evidence that was given by professors uh, Messamore and, and, and um, Ms. Jones, there was a dispute that Ontario raised about who really is entitled as a quote unquote Indian. And interestingly, this issue was raised before the arbitrators as well. And Justice Burbage deals with that, which we're going to skip over because it's not relevant except to say that you're seeing the same kinds of arguments um, that we saw. Um, that, that this was an argument that was raised and considered. The next part I want to go to is actually um, Well, at page 459, I've highlighted that section because this is where Justice Burbage makes the decisions which are actually then embodied in the award that we started out with, saying there's no doubt that pre-Confederation liability is under section 111, 112, and that um, Ontario and Quebec have not been discharged by the capitalization of the fixed annuities. We've been through that. I think the next part to go to is at page 462. Now this is where Justice Burbage finds that section 109 applies. I'm at the middle of the page. Now looking to the particular matter my mind lends a ready assent to Mr. Robinson's argument, Mr. Robinson was acting for the Dominion, that it is equitable that this burden should fall upon Ontario. We're talking about the post-Confederation burden. Ontario has the advantages resulting from the ownership of the lands and it should bear the burden. I agree to that. Considered as a matter by itself, it is highly inequitable that any part of the burden should fall upon Quebec and even in a greater degree inequitable that Nova Scotia or New Brunswick or any of the provinces that came into the union since 1867 should be called upon as a part of the dominion to contribute anything towards making good to the tribes entitled the increases, increased annuities payable to them under the treaties mentioned. So it's interesting, he goes on to find, he says, I would have no hesitation in joining in making an award upon the equitable principles. Now here, it had been uh, agreed, in fact, part of the legislation appointing these arbitrators said that questions on a matter of law could be further appealed. So Justice Burbage here is saying, you know, as a matter of equity, this is clear to me, but we're gonna consider this a matter of law and allow there to be an appeal on this point. So this is why it, Maybe I maybe didn't phrase that co correctly, but they determined that it's a matter of law, even though you'll see there's a lot of reference to equity here, to what's fair and equitable. It's anyway determined to be a, a disputed point of law and, and that's how it gets to appeal. He says that specifically uh, halfway through page 463. 
The case is one in which we ought, I think, to proceed upon our view of a disputed question of law. And then he goes on at page 464. And, he, and he's addressing the argument that Ontario makes, again, that the, the language of the treaty doesn't create a trust. The language itself doesn't create a trust. It doesn't require, it's not explicit that the, the annu augmented annuities are to be paid from a fund generated or filled with the proceeds of the ceded lands. And there's also this argument that we'll get to. Interestingly, I think it's... Uh, Justice Sedgwick, who describes it as no self-respecting state would actually, you know, um, grant an interest or lien or trust over its land. So Justice Boyd is, is addressing this idea that there's different kinds of trusts in issue here. And he says at the beginning of page 464, it is possible that the Crown did not, after the surrender, hold the ceded territory on any trust that would be enforceable in law. But in a broader sense, and I agree fully with the learned Chancellor Boyd in thinking that the treaties in question and the British North America Act should be construed in a large and liberal way, it seems to me that the Indians in entering into such treaties reposed a confidence in the Crown that it would manage the ceded lands fairly for the advantage of all concerned. And so as to raise their out if that were fairly possible, the monies to pay the increased annuities, and that there was a corresponding duty resting on the Crown to do so. In that sense, the lands were at the Union, it seems to me, subject to a trust or interest existing in respect of the same. And he goes on later to explain, you know, Section 109 talks about a trust in the lands or trust or other interest in the lands. He goes on to explain that it doesn't matter whether you're talking about lands or proceeds of lands. It doesn't uh, present any difficulty in, in view of the facts of the case, he says. It's the same thing. That, that question of lands versus proceeds of lands is dealt with by a, a number of the arbitrators and judges, um, and they all uh, concede that um, lands means and proceeds of lands is referring to the same thing. So it's interesting that um, it, it's interesting that here Justice Burbage is saying that he's acknowledging that it's possible that this particular trust would not be enforceable in law, but nevertheless, on a broader sense, it exists. This point about enforceability at law we'll come back to. It's an interesting point. So now we're ready to move on to the decision of the five judges of the Supreme Court. And, and don't worry, I'm not gonna go through. Fortunately, one of them just concurred without writing a decision. So that cuts it down to four <laughs> that we'll go through. Here we start at page, we skip ahead to page 492. And we're going to start with the decision of the Chief Justice, Justice Strong. So the first several pages of Justice Strong's decision is taken up with the history. And in fact, he reproduces some of the same awards um, and provisions of the constitution that we've already seen and addressed. So we can skip ahead to Justice, the Chief Justice's um, analysis, which begins on page 503. There was a five judge panel of the Supreme Court Three of the judges, Chief Justice Strong, Justice Sedgwick, and Justice Tashiro were in the majority, and Justices Gwynn and King were in the minority. And you may recall the ultimate decision was that there was no interest, Section 109 interest, in fact. So we're looking at the majority decision, which is contrary to what Canada now suggests is the appropriate um, results now that we understand the treaty in a way that these uh, these crown act these actors and judges at the time 
did not. And remember, of course, the First Nations weren't party to these arguments. And that may be an explanation for why these actors and, and judges didn't view the treaty the way that we understand it today. So um, Justice, Chief Justice Strong says at page 503, I proceed to consider the questions thus presented by the appeal. Second half of the first, well, beginning of the first the paragraph, there is nothing showing that either the original annuities of 600 pounds and 500 pounds per annum or $1.60 per head were to be paid out of the proceeds of the lands. And he goes on at page 504 to say, it would have been in the highest degree inconvenient that the power of dealing freely with them, the lands, for these purposes should be fettered with any latent lien or trust. This is the point about inconvenience. It, it's really no self-respecting state would do such a thing. And he goes on at page 505. I find this interesting. This is where we talk about the fact that, that the appeal is proceeding on a disputed question of law and equity might have a different result. So here at 505, the Chief Justice says, he notes at the very last paragraph that um, an appeal shall only be in respect of points described by the arbitrators in which they shall indicate that their award has proceeded on disputed questions of law. This of course limits this court to purely legal considerations in adjudicating on the matter in controversy. And it excludes all such equitable considerations as to, might, as to what might be fair and reasonable outside the construction of the British North America Act and the legal interpretation of the treaties. And I have so endeavored to deal with the case. On page 506, here he turns to the award we started with in 1870, the, the award of the section 142 arbitrators. And he deals with the argument, the arguments made by Ontario about the import of that decision. And he says, the last paragraph on 506, then turning to the award of 1870, I am of opinion that this point was substantially decided by the arbitrators appointed under the 142nd section. I've already stated the 13th section of that award, which we looked at, determining that lands in either Ontario and Quebec surrendered by Indians in consideration of annuities should be the absolute property of the province in which the lands might be situated free from any charge. Free from any charge. And he's forgotten or overlooked or was not directed to the rest of that, that uh, clause, which says by the other of the said provinces. Now, this might've just been a slip, except that he makes the same slip twice. If we look at page 507, the bottom of page 507, the arbitrators must therefore be taken to have had in mind, and here he's talking about the 1870 arbitrators, Justice Hennessy, that's clear from a few uh, lines above. He's talking about 1870. We're at the bottom of page 507. The arbitrators must therefore be taken to have had in mind all the annuities, the original fixed annuities, as well as those contingently provided for. They held that the lands vested absolutely, free from any charge. And this must have included both, both the fixed and the increase. But again, he's missing the phrase, by the other of the said provinces. He doesn't deal with the potential charge in favor of the First Nations. And Justice Hennessy, my friends from Ontario make the same omission in their written submissions at paragraph 254. of their submissions, Ontario submissions. 
So I'd like to skip ahead to Justice Sedgwick because he um, wrote separate reasons but concurred in the result with the, the Chief Justice. Now we know Justice Tashiro did as well. You can see on page 508, Tashiro J, J con concurred without writing reasons. But uh, if we move on to Justice Sedgwick, his reasons begin at page 527. Sedgwick's decision, of course, Justice Gwynne's decision is my favorite. But uh, Justice Sedgwick's decision, I think, is a bit of a linchpin here. So I think it's, it's important to look at it in detail. Justice Sedgwick acknowledges at, uh, first one little point I'd say, incidentally, is on page 550, sorry, 528, halfway through the page, he makes a note that it is very clear that the Dominion entered upon its national existence with a fixed and indisputable debt, a fixed debt. And this just called in mind the evidence we heard from Professor Messamore that the Dominion, it was clearly intended that the Dominion take on a knowable, known and knowable debt um, because the intention was to treat all of the provinces equally. So the Dominion would not have assumed a debt that it could never know, for example, if that debt were to be based upon Ontario's resource revenues. I just point that out because I found it interesting that it really aligns with the evidence that uh, Professor Messamore gave us about the Dominion's intentions in assuming debt under Section 111. But really, uh, the part that I want to take you to in Justice Sedgwick's reasons is at page 533. Starting with the paragraph on the whole. On the whole, have we got it? On the whole, I am of opinion that if the lands in question or the proceeds or the proceeds of those lands are burdened by the operation of the Indian treaties, if they have been put in pledge or hypothecated in order to render more secure the stipulated annuities, if the Indians have in them a property right, whether legal or equitable, capable of being enforced or adjudic adjudicated upon by petition of right or otherwise in a court of justice, if the Indians have a legally enforceable right, then Ontario, having under the Union Act, being the BNA Act, taken these lands, she has taken them subject to this burden and is therefore bound to relieve Quebec therefrom. Justice Sedgwick and the other judges were looking at this as a question as to who's responsible. Is it Ontario and Quebec? under section 112, or is it just Ontario under section 109? They don't actually frame it as an issue involving the Dominion. In fact, in some places they say this really has nothing to do with the Dominion. In fact, it, it, at page 530, Justice Sedgwick describes it that way. He said, is Ontario alone liable for these annuities or is it conjointly liable with Quebec? The matter as I view it is of no significance to the Dominion. It is solely a question as between Ontario and Quebec. This is the way that they're looking at it. Because even if it was the Dominion under Section 111, of course, the Dominion can recoup from Ontario and Quebec. So fundamentally, the decision is, is this Ontario alone or is it Ontario and Quebec? And Justice Sedgwick here in the passage we read on page 533 says, well, if this was a right in property that the Indians, as he says, could enforce in a court, well, then I would agree that Ontario has taken these lands subject to this burden and is therefore bound to relieve Quebec. But just as Sedgwick goes on to find the next page 534, that there is no such legally enforceable right. Effectively, he says, this is the part that my friends have cited, a self-respecting state in dealing with its citizens in matters of contract does not usually give the public property as a security for the fulfillment of its obligations. Then at page 536. Here again on page 536, we see an, a discussion of the law concerning whether there's a difference between lands and proceeds of lands, the conclusion being that there isn't. 
But the key part is the last paragraph on the page. Now, there is here no express creation of a charge, whether upon the lands or upon their proceeds. Are we to read into or add to this stipulation what it is argued, it impliedly contains, quote, and the lands hereby ceded or the proceeds thereof after deducting cost of administration is hereby charged with the payment of such augmented annuities? If we are, then I think the Indians have an interest and Ontario is bound to discharge it. He goes on to say, but is that the true meaning of the contract? Was that the intention of the parties? Did the Indians in consideration of the session get the personal obligation of the Crown plus an interest in the proceeds of the ceded lands? This is the question he asked, what was the intention of the treaty? Was it that the Indians would get an interest in the proceeds of the ceded lands? And he answers the question, no. We see that on page 538. The beginning of the page, he says, for my part, I cannot bring myself to think that it was ever within the contemplation of the parties that as security for payment, the Indians were to have a charge upon the proceeds of the ceded lands. Now today we would answer that question differently, I submit, Justice Hennessy. Okay, and tell me how you would answer it. The stage one decision upheld by the Court of Appeal, the majority of the Court of Appeal found that the First Nations have an interest in the proceeds of the ceded lands. The annuities to be, the augmented annuities are to correspond to a share of the revenues, the, the proceeds of the lands. That's the basis on which their annuities are to be augmented as a share. This is a revenue sharing agreement. And I'm looking for my submissions where um, we cite from, and I have lost the uh, paragraph number from my head, but it's a paragraph where Justice Hennessy, you describe it as a revenue sharing model and the Court of Appeal adopts that interpretation of the treaty. And I'm going to find that for you, but I'll, I'll let my, my colleagues look for it. Oh, here we've got it. It's at 383 of our submissions. Paragraph? Pa paragraph 383. And that refers to your, when I say your, this court's um, decision on stage one at paragraph 469 to 470. So I'll pull that up. I'm reading from sec uh, paragraph 469 of the stage one decision. For the Crown, the idea of sharing revenues was novel, but reflected their goal to obtain access to the land and resources, limit their liability, and deal honorably with the Anishinaabe. A treaty that linked the future revenue of the territory to the annuities payable to the Anishinaabe answered the uncertainties and risks present. A revenue sharing model was consistent with the perspective that the Anishinaabe chiefs held about their relationships with the newcomers and the land. It was also consistent with the Anishinaabe's duties of responsibility as leaders toward their people. In addition, the sharing model invited renewal as circumstances changed. And most importantly, a sharing model was consistent with the principle of reciprocity. And these paragraphs were picked up by the Court of Appeal and cited by the Court of Appeal at paragraph 307 of their decision. When the Court of Appeal says, I'm just, uh, the reason I asked the, the, that question was because um, you started out by saying stage one and the Ontario Court of Appeal up um, found that the First Nations have an interest in the proceeds of the ceded land and you use that language and I don't see it in your, in your 
factum, paragraph 383, that you put it like that? A am I wrong? Well, I guess the dis distinction is we acknowledge that it's a, a revenue sharing model and that the right to increase annuities is based on a share of the proceeds of the resource revenues. And I understand that you're distinguishing that from saying that the First Nations have an interest in the proceeds. I'm not so much distinguishing it as you took me through the reasons that we're focused on, is this a charge or an interest? And you conclude that the world has changed since they wrote their decision and that stage one and the, and the Ontario Court of Appeal held that there was an interest. But I'm wondering if you're saying that for the first time in submissions, I don't see it in the factum unless it's, unless I've missed it. And I don't know if you're pointing to any language uh, like that by well, I will either this court or the Court of Appeal. And I may not quite understand your question, Justice Hennessy, but I will point out that the Dominion's position back in 1895 was that this was Ontario's burden because the First Nations did have an interest, a Section 109 interest. So this is a consistent position that the Dominion, the federal government has taken, that the First Nations have an interest in the ceded, in the proceeds of the ceded lands. Excuse me for a moment. So I'm grateful to my colleague who's pointed out paragraph six of our written submissions is also relevant. Okay. Just that we know that the, our position is that the emanation of the crown that received the lands subject to the interests of the First Nations expressed in the augmentation clause. But really, I think my answer is that, that even in 1895, the Dominion's position was that the First Nations' interest in augmented annuities was a Section 109 interest. Therefore, it was an interest in the lands and proceeds. That's a consistent position. You were taking me to paragraph six of yours? Yes, I, I was, but... But uh, I don't think paragraph six actually does hit the mark there. Um, I don't see it. No, but uh, in any event, is, is my, I think I've given you my, my best answer, which as I said, is that this has consistently been the position of the Dominion that, um, that e and even if, the annuity was understood to be capped at the equivalent of $4 per person, soft cap, always a soft cap. But even if it was understood that $4 was a soft cap, the Dominion has always taken the position that the First Nations interest in augmented annuities is tied to the land and the proceeds of the land and therefore constitutes an interest as that is understood within section 109. That was the position of the Dominion in 1895, and it's still the position of Canada. So if I can, Justice Hennessy, then, I'd like to carry on with what Justice Sedgwick has to say at page 538. And here again, he focuses on the right to enforce the interest in the courts, finding that, well, the First Nations can't enforce this, so it can't really be a legally enforceable trust, and therefore it can't be a Section 109 situation. He says, I think it's highlighted one, just a sentence before the highlighted portion, one may be interested in a property, but have no legal interest in it. If he has a legal interest, he can enforce it against the property. If in the present case, the lands in question are burdened with the charge, the Indians have such an interest in their proceeds as will enable them to follow the monies no matter where they are or to whom paid, they have a property right in the monies themselves, indefeasible, indestructible, which the state must acknowledge and to which the courts must give effect. And he goes on to say, in the present case, the Indians are interested in these lands in the sense that the augmentation of the annuities wholly depends upon what they will sell for, but not in the sense that they have any right in 
or to the proceeds of such sales, no matter what they amount to. They have no interest in these proceeds. Two points here. One being, again, he focuses on the legal enforceability of the First Nations right. And my answer to that, Justice Hennessy, is this court in its stage one decision, the fact that we're here in court demonstrates the legal enforceability of the First Nations right in this treaty. This treaty right that this court has found in the stage one decision. But I do acknowledge that another issue here, I do acknowledge it's, it's a bit of a tricky question. Obviously we had a three, two split at the Supreme Court back in the day. It is a tricky question. Does the treaty actually just say that in the event of net revenues, that's the trigger by which the crown will then augment the annuities? Or does it go beyond that and suggest that in fact, the augmented annuities are to be based upon and paid out of this increase, this, uh, these, these revenues, these proceeds. That's a tricky question that these judges were directly dealing with and phrase it that way. Was it just a, a, an event upon which the First Nations received some right? Or was it that they actually received an interest in the proceeds and our submission and has been consistent for over 100 years. No, this treaty did provide an, a right to, the, to, to share in the proceeds, to be paid augmented annuities on the basis of those proceeds. And that doesn't tell us what that share will be. In fact, it, could, it should be subject to the discretion of the Crown. You know, in, in this case, it was understood to be up to $4 per person and anything beyond that was graciousness. It was a discretionary matter. But it was it was understood by the Dominion that um, even if it's a discretionary amount, that amount corresponds with, or is linked to, or is paid out of the proceeds of the lands. And and I submit to you, Justice Hennessy, that is in line with this court and the Court of Appeals' um, interpretation of the annuity promise today. And that's why I referred you to the language of revenue sharing model, revenue sharing, that, that has the concept of it, that it's out of these actual revenues that the share will be provided. Now, just on this point about enforceability, I, I do find it interesting that, as I said, Justice Sedgwick, I think of as a bit of a linchpin because on the one hand, he sides with concurs with Justice, the Chief Justice Strong in saying there is no Section 109 interest here, but if the First Nations had a legal, legally enforceable right, it would be different. Um, remember that Justice Burbage as an arbitrator said, well, they don't have a legally enforceable right, but in any event, on a, in a broader sense, they have an, a Section 109 interest. So Justice Burbage didn't think that legal enforceability of the right was determinative of whether or not it was a Section 109 interest. Justice Sedgwick seems to think that that is a, a relevant point to which I would say, as we just went through Justice Hennessy, of course, we have learned that it is a legally enforceable right. So I submit that Justice Sedgwick's, uh, where Justice Sed Sedgwick landed in the Supreme Court would have been different if he did understand the treaty the way that we now understand it, now that we've heard from the First Nations. Now, I want to go through Justice Gwynn and very briefly Justice King. And um, shall we keep going or would, would we like a break? Time. It's a good time for me for a break, the natural spot. Okay, let's take a break then. All right. 15 minutes. This court is to down for 15 minutes. This court is resumed. Please be seated.
Justice Hennessy, we're finished with the minor majority de uh, decision in the Supreme Court, so we're going to turn now to the minority, starting with Justice Gwynne, whose decisions begin on page 508 of the Supreme Court report. Thank you. Interestingly, Justice Gwynne actually frames the question slightly differently than uh, what I pointed out to you with Justice Sedgwick, where he actually says, the sole question involved is which of the governments, that of the dominion or that of the provinces is responsible. Although, as I said, I think Justice Sedgwick got it a bit better on this point when he noted that even if it were the dominion, of course, the dominion recoups then from Ontario and Quebec. But in any event, starting with Justice Gwynne, um, I'd like to start at page, at the very bottom of page 511, going on to 512. And the reason I'm drawing the court's attention to this passage is this is the, I would say now famous passage that has been cited so many times since by the Supreme Court in recent cases, even about uh, the honor of the crown. So I think it's uh, worthwhile to, to review that. Justice Gwynne really has quite a very long sentence, <laughs> very long sentence. <laughs> so I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I'll read where it starts at the bottom of 511. The terms and conditions expressed in those instruments, treaties, as to be performed by or on behalf of the Crown, have always been regarded as involving a trust graciously assumed by the Crown to the fulfillment of which the Indians, the faith and honor of the crown is pledged and which trust has always been most, faith, most faithfully fulfilled as a treaty obligation of the crown. So he goes on at uh, the, to the second half of paragraph 512 to express his interpretation of the treaty. Starting now, now, as the payment of the increased annuity is expressly made contingent upon the fund to be realized or produced out of the territories expressed to be ceded, proving to be sufficient to enable the government of Canada, now at that time, the province of Canada, to pay such increased sum without incurring loss, the plain construction of Her Majesty's promise and undertaking is that such increased sum in the event of the fund permitting it should be paid out of the funds so to be produced and so enabling the government to pay it without incurring loss. The fulfillment of that promise and undertaking involved a trust graciously assumed by Her Majesty affecting the fund to be produced and realized out of the territories expressed to be respectively ceded to Her Majesty. So here you see Justice Gwynne interprets that the annuity shall be paid out of the funds produced by the territories, which is where we see the trust created or the interest of the First Nations in the actual proceeds. Now I want to go to page 522. And do you say that this court must find a trust or a charge? No, I think, an, or other interest is the language that we should be looking at, Justice Hennessy, because I do think there is some ambiguity about what a trust or a charge is, but I do think the language of other interest is sufficiently broad to make it clear that the First Nations uh, in, interest is, is an interest that fits. I think. In my submission, the language of interest is, is deliberately broad to cover things that may not be a legally enforceable trust. And I think that's what Justice Burbage meant when he was acting as an arbitrator and said, in a broader sense, the First Nations have an interest. So Justice Gwynne says on page 522, now it is sufficiently obvious, I think, that if any debt or liability to pay to the Indians, parties to the treaties of 1850, by any augmentation in their annuities under the stipulations of those treaties has accrued in any of the years subsequent to Confederation, 
Such cannot be held to have constituted a debt or liability of the late province of Canada, which ceased to exist upon confederation being accomplished. Much less can it be said to have constituted a debt or liability of the late province of Canada existing at the Union. This is a point that Justice Wynne makes again on the next page, 523. Here I draw this to the court's attention. Sorry, did you say, uh, Justice? Oh, he's quoting Wynne. from the, um, he's quoting from the arbitration? Uh, no, I don't believe that he is. I thought you said Justice Burbage, but no. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I may have misspoken. I was speaking earlier about Justice Burbage, um, right. having said, you know, in a broader sense, we're talking about an interest. I was just taking us back in response to your question about, is this a trust or interest? But having answered that question, now we're going back to Justice Gwynne's decision in the Supreme Court. And the point here that I'm making is a little bit of a tangent. It responds to the argument that I anticipate my friends from Ontario will, will argue that um, the debt or liability to pay these increased annuities is a debt that existed at the union because it was written in the treaty. The treaty existed at the union, the debt travels with that treaty and it's a debt existing at the union. And you've seen in our submissions earlier, Justice Hennessy, Canada takes the position that the debt doesn't crystallize until the lands produce the revenues. And Justice Gwynne is making the same point. This cannot have been, uh, the augmentation in the annuities under the stipulation that the funds must, of the, land, the lands must produce the funds cannot have meant that this was a debt existing at the time of the union, or it was a debt or liability of the province of Canada. For example, revenues realized in 1873 cannot be considered debts or liabilities of the province of Canada, which ceased to exist in 1867. So Justice Gwynne makes this point on page 522 and 523. And I just brought to the court's attention because I think he eloquently expresses Canada's position today that the debt or liability, it, we cannot be operating under a section 111, 112 regime for a number of reasons. One of which is in order to operate under section 111, we have to be dealing with debts or liabilities existing at the union. And our argument is th these debts and liabilities, which are to share a portion of the proceeds of the ceded lands, were not existing at the union. They don't actually crystallize until resource revenues permit. So on page 524, we get to Justice Gwynne's interpretation of the particular interest here. And he acknowledges that this is not a legal trust that affects a purchaser with notice, but it is nevertheless a trust obligation assumed by Her Majesty in respect of the proceeds of the ceded territories. And I'd like to read from the bottom of page 524. This is a very long uh, passage, so I'll try to just highlight the bits about it. But he says, first of all, as I summarize, that the promise constituted a trust obligation existing in respect of the proceeds of the lands. He says, the fulfillment of such obligation, the Indians had an undoubted interest. Now he goes on to say that the British North America Act was never framed with intent to provide for the case of a trust capable of recognition in a court of law or equity as being attached to the lands themselves so as to affect a purchaser with notice as contended by the Learned Council for Ontario. The estate of Her Majesty in the ungranted lands of the Crown never were nor were supposed to be, nor indeed could be subject to any such trust. And this is where he's accepting the argument of, of Council for Ontario at the time that um, no, the lands are not affected, but with a trust so as to affect a purchaser with notice. It's not that type of a trust. But he goes on to say, but the undertaking of Her Majesty in the treaties constituting as it did a trust obligation assumed by Her Majesty in respect of the proceeds of the ceded territories, 
the language of the section, he's talking about section 109. Mm -hmm. The language of the section appears to be quite appropriate to the expression in the act of a provision in accordance with the principles of law, equity, and common sense, that the fund out of which the augmentation in the annuities were contemplated to be paid should, after the union equally as before, provide for the payment of augmentations. Here I think, I, I want to go on to the bottom of that paragraph where he says, Her Majesty's Government of the Province of Ontario must in all reason and justice take the property mentioned in the section subject to the same obligation as to the payment of augmentations of the annuities if any such accrue due after the union as the late province of Canada would have held them if no union had taken place. And I, I think it's interesting here that he is referring to um, principles of law, equity, common sense, <coughs> reason and justice. And in fact, at the end of the page, he goes on to say, this was the unanimous judgment of the arbitrators. The arbitrators unanimously held that this was a section 109 interest. That judgment is not at variance with any principle of law or any statutory provision. On the contrary, it is in perfect accordance with the plainest principles of justice and is not open to any sound legal objection. So here Justice Gwynne is not just relying on the language of section 109, but he's relying on principles of law and equity, common sense and justice. Now, finally, I'd like to take a look at what Justice King has to say. Justice King's uh, decision starts at page 540. What, what I want to address in just, Justice King's decision is I want to again take you to a passage that you will have read because it's been repeatedly cited in, in by the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council, for example, and, and also by uh, my friends Ontario in their submissions, this, this oft-repeated phrase we, we have heard, which he makes on page 546 of the decision, sort of halfway down the page. Practically, it does not now, and it never did, make any difference to the Indians, whether they were declared to have an interest in the proceeds of the land or not their assurance of payment would be equal in either case. But he goes on to say, the matter did become a ma uh, did to come to have practical significance when it became necessary to consider the nature of the transaction in relation to the constitution, in relation to which government was to pay. And I submit today, Justice Hennessy, it does have practical significance significance to the First Nations in this case, whether or not they were declared to have an interest in the proceeds of the land, because their claim for increased annuities is based on, they're asking for a share of those proceeds. So they very much do have an interest. It's, it's of importance to them whether or not they're declared to have an interest in the proceeds. And I submit that in fact, they have been declared to have an interest in the proceeds. That was the effect of the stage one judgment. So I think when Justice King makes that statement, practically it does not now and it never did make any difference. He's not really saying that it doesn't matter, you know, who, who pays the First Nations, although maybe it doesn't, but that's not what Justice King is saying here. What he's saying here is it doesn't matter whether or not they have an interest in the proceeds, they're going to get paid regardless. But in fact, Today, the First Nations have made a claim that they have an interest in the proceeds, and it does make a difference, as Justice King notes, it certainly makes a difference to the issue of allocation of responsibility between Canada and Ontario. Well, isn't that 
Isn't that the point he's making? It doesn't make a difference to them. It makes a difference. It's of importance to the crowns. It certainly is of importance to the crown because that's going to be how we interpret whether this is a section 109 interest or not. And in which case, whether it's Ontario's responsibility, but it also is of importance to the first nations, whether they're declared to have an interest in the proceeds of the lands. It's not sufficient as I, I understand their position that they'd simply be declared to um, be entitled to annuities that would be entirely at the discretion of the crown as to how how those annuities would be augmented. Their interest, they've been determined to have an interest in the proceeds. Now we can talk about how big that share should be, but the determination is that they are entitled to some share of the proceeds. Well, their, their greatest interest is being paid and not waiting while the crowns figure out as between themselves, who's ultimately responsible. But uh, I take it your, to your next point, because that, that, that's what Justice King is saying. Yes, I think in this case now, we've heard my friends argue that if given the opportunity to engage in a process, they would ideally, in fact, they're asking as part of future implementation, that your honor provide guidance or make orders that require the Crown to engage with the First Nations about the exploitation of the resources which are Ontario's. So the First Nations in my submission are claiming an interest in the lands in that respect. So it, it does matter to them whether or not their interest is um, described as an actual interest in the lands or simply an interest in getting paid annuities that may be at the discretion of the Crown. But Canada is saying today that, that there is an interest. That is that, that what they have is an interest as broadly defined by Justice Gwynne. Yes, yes, Canada is, is taking that position today. And as I said earlier, that's a consistent position that Canada was taking back in 1895 as well. Now, I, I do acknowledge, and I think it's succinctly summarized by Justice King at page 548, that as I, I noted earlier, I certainly do see the, the distinction that the Supreme Court was grappling with here, the two different ways you could interpret the treaty, and that certainly that they interpreted at the time, because he says, he says quite clearly at the bottom of page 547. So what does the, the augmentation promise actually mean? He says, um, for example, 547, sort of third paragraph, here it was manifestly contemplated that the land might be sold. And as there was to be no limit to the continuance of the annuity, it would not be reasonable to suppose that there was to exist a perpetual lien. So he's describing that the interest of the First Nations is not like they have a perpetual lien on the property. But he goes on to say now, but it was agreed that if the ceded territory should at any future period produce revenues at the bottom, you know, it, it may mean, now this may mean merely that the revenues shall furnish a measure of increased price or be a circumstance to determine whether or not it shall be paid. Or on the other hand, it may mean that a part of the revenue shall go to the Indians by way of increased annuities in a certain event, certain event being there's sufficient, there's net revenues. Where two interpretations of such an agreement are open, one consistent with and the other inconsistent with a provision for the security of the unpaid vendor, it would seem more appropriate to treat it as giving the more effectual security to the unpaid vendor. So really he's saying, you could look at it either way. It, either it is just that it's a, uh, it furnishes merely, a, it's a circumstance to be determined whether or not they shall be paid. On the other hand, he says, it may mean that part of the revenue should actually go to them. And when you've got these competing in interpretations, you really should be picking the interpretation that provides the better security for the vendor, or in this case, the First Nations who ceded the land. So he goes on to say, at page 548, acknowledging that th these two different ways of interpreting it, and that it's not, I mean, it's not a straight 
straightforward issue. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had a 3-2 split. He acknowledges it, but he says, upon the whole, therefore, but not without doubt, it seems to me that there is a reasonably clear manifestation of an intention to devote a portion of the proceeds of the ceded lands in certain events to the increased annuities. If this is so, it would follow that Ontario getting the land subject to the trust would have to discharge the burden, which before that was upon the province of Canada. So is one of the, is, is it possible that one of the ways of distinguishing the minority from the majority, not totally, but is the use of private law concepts notion of purchasers and liens. That's an interesting way to look at it that I had not considered, but I take what you're meaning is that the majority decision that found there is no section 109 interest was very much focused on the law of perpetual liens, you know, enforceable, legally enforceable trusts. Commercial one-time transactions between uninterested parties. Yes. Related parties. Yeah. Um, Whereas the arbitrators, all three of the arbitrators who were all judges, all three of those arbitrators and the minority judges here, um, you know, reference the need to, to interpret the treaties liberally, L large and liberal interpretation was one of the phrases that we looked at. Uh, and here we see Justice uh, King's reference to, with two competing interpretations, you take the one that is uh, affords the more effectual security to the unpaid vendor. So yeah, I think I think it's correct. You could look at it that way. But even so, keeping in mind that even, even knowing, oh, this is where I get back to what Justice Burbage, the arbitrator had to say. Well, there's a couple of points. First of all, Justice Burbage says, well, he acknowledges that this isn't a trust enforceable at law, but in a broader sense, it fits within 109. What he's saying is he doesn't need a trust enforceable in law. Yeah, so it's not, it doesn't matter to him. Now it seems to matter to Chief Justice Strong and Justice Sedgwick, it seems to matter to them whether or not you can enforce this at law. This is one of the criteria that they seem to be considering when they determine you can't enforce this at law, so it can't be um, a trust under 109. Although Sedgwick does say, you can't enforce this at law. Well, in fact, the First Nations are here today because they are enforcing it at law. So one of the two but, points- but It's enforceable at law based on an, instant, on an interpretation, firstly, that involved as one of the parties bringing an interpretation to the court, the First Nations, but secondly, on constitutional principles. That's why I'm saying that the court at stage one, the Ontario Court of Appeal, took into consideration the primacy of treaty rights under Section 35 of the Constitution. And so that founds the enforceability at law. And I would go further to say that um, remember that all of these actors, these judicial officers were dealing at the time with the arguments made before them by crown actors who thought they were operating with a treaty where anything beyond $4 was purely a matter of grace. Even in that context, which today we would view as a very narrow reading of the treaty, even in that context, in that limited treaty interpretation, Three arbitrators and two Supreme Court judges found there's a sufficient interest of the First Nations. So I don't think it's just that in the modern interpretation, now we have courts that are paying more attention to, you know, Section 35 rights. Um, because I think even back then, more than 100 years ago, these three arbitrators and two judges at the Supreme Court reviewing this from a large and liberal perspective, understanding what is most effectual to give security to the First Nations. Well, that's how I frame the question first. Is the difference as between the minority and the majority? One looking at private law concepts and one looking at broader 
concepts yes. that founded the treaty. Yes, I think you're right then, Justice Hennessy. Well, I, 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 it's, yep. it just arises now in my mm -hmm. mind. So I think that uh, I've taken the court to the parts of that decision that I, I had wanted to. So I'd like to move on now. What happens next? And what happens next is this decision goes to the Judicial Committee of the Privy Council. Oops, sorry. The decision of the, the JCPC is at tab one of the compendium. And I, I am bold enough to say, Justice Hennessy, that the JCPC decision can be pretty much dismissed as irrelevant. The JCPC decision was very strictly confined to whether the annuities were connected with or attached to the surrendered territory and its proceeds in the sense of Section 109 to form a charge upon it in the hands of the province. The JCPC did not deal with equity or principles of law and justice or the common law, unlike Justice Gwynne did, for example, when we looked at uh, page 200 and 523 of Justice Gwynne's decision, where he mentions reason, justice, principles of equity. And even as I drew your honor's attention to, Chief Justice Strong said, I'm making this decision on the basis that it's a disputed question of law. I'm not looking at equity. The JCPC did not look at equity at all either. It very strictly confined itself to this tight legal question and took a very, the tight legal question about, is this a trust under 109? And did not take a large and liberal or purposive interpretation of the treaty. In fact, this is where we see this often cited description of the treaty by the JCPC at paragraph 14. Paragraph 14, the JCPC is talking about two of the learned arbitrators, and here it's because Justice or arbitrator Casso, remember, had very brief reasons. He concurred, but he had brief reasons. So here the JCPC is talking about just uh, uh, Chancellor Boyd and uh, arbitrator Burbage. They explained at some length the reasons by which they were influenced at a, in arriving at the conclusion that they did, that this was a section 109 interest. The second sentence of paragraph 14, they start from the proposition that the treaties of 1850 being in the nature of international compacts ought to be liberally construed. That rule, when rightly applied in circumstances which admit of its application is useful and salutary, but it goes no farther than this, that the stipulations of an international treaty ought, when the language of the instrument permits, to be so interpreted as to promote the main objects of the treaty. Their lordships venture to doubt whether the rule, we're talking about the rule of liberal construction, has any application to those parts, even of a proper international treaty, let alone this treaty, which contain the terms of an ordinary mercantile transaction in which the respective stipulations of the contracting parties are expressed in language which is free from ambiguity. In other words, the JCPC here is saying this treaty is in the nature of an ordinary mercantile transaction, which is free from ambiguity. So therefore you don't need to apply the principle of liberal interpretation. And we know of course, that um, this is now at odds with the modern um, approach to treaty interpretation. Furthermore in paragraph 15, here are the JCPC falsely assumes that the First Nations had no interest in stipulating that they had an interest in the proceeds of the land. This is where they cite from Justice King, and I've gone through 
how I suggest that should be interpreted. But in paragraph 15, the Lords go on to say, why a liberal construction should be resorted to, to raise an equitable right of no pecuniary advantage to the First Nations, their lordships are at a loss to understand. I, I'm reading sort of two thirds of the way down that paragraph 15. Why the, the, mar the margin there? I think it's actually highlighted, yeah. So here again, the, 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 their lordships are saying they're at a loss to understand why we need a liberal construction when there's to raise an equitable right of no pecuniary advantage. But of course, we understand the treaty now and as did five judges from Canada, three of them arbitrators, two of them in the minority as uh, providing an actual pecuniary advantage to the First Nations. So when I tell you that um, the decision of the JCPC can be effectively dismissed or discarded as irrelevant, you keep in mind that it did not involve the First Nations, who would have argued that they did have a pecuniary interest in the lands. And you may ask, well, if we're going to discard the decision of the JCPC because the First Nations weren't there, why don't we just discard the decision of the Supreme Court and the arbitrators because the First Nations weren't there either? But keep in mind that although the arbitrators and the Supreme Court didn't include the First Nations, at least two of the three judges and all of the three arbitrators considered their interests and recognized, in Justice Gwynne's case, explicitly recognized the role of the honor of the Crown which is absent from the JCPC's decision. So I'd like to carry on. What happened next? And I submit that everything that happened after those decisions of the Supreme Court and the JCPC with respect to the division of responsibility as between the Dominion and Ontario and Quebec was wrong, wrong, wrong. Wrong number one, the arbitrators issued their 10th award, January 7th, 1898. That award is in our compendium. At tab 12, we don't really need to pull it up. It's pretty straightforward. I, I included it just so you can follow the history of it. There's nothing remarkable about it. It was really what the arbitrators were bound to find once they had this decision of the JCPC. They had no choice but to find that the obligation to pay augmented annuities rested with the Dominion under Section 111. which of course then meant the Dominion was entitled to co collect from Ontario and Quebec. So that's what the first wrong was that, that, that um, th this decision that the arbitrators were obliged to make, that this was a section 111, 112 situation. And this led the governments, all three governments, Dominion, Ontario and Quebec down the wrong path to assume that the Dominion had to pay the First Nations and recoup from Ontario and Quebec. The right path is Ontario should be held directly liable to the First Nations to share in the proceeds under section 109. But the governments were obliged by the 10th award, which resulted from the Supreme Court and JCPC decisions to, for one, bring Quebec into the mix and, and find that it was the Dominion that had to pay and then recoup from Ontario and Quebec. And you may recall as well, although I didn't put it in the brief, or maybe I did, that um, even after the JCPC decision, Quebec was still resisting this finding and actually appealed the 10th award, 
whereby the arbitrator said, this is a 111, 112 situation. Quebec appealed that, and not surprisingly, their appeal was dismissed from the bench. This decision had been made, but Quebec was still um, resisting it. And you can understand why, as arbitrator Burbage expressed, there's an unfairness to the idea that Quebec should be liable to pay these increased annuities that are subject to Ontario's collection of on revenues from Ontario's resources. But bound as they were by the judgment and the 10th award, the, cover the governments, the three governments, negotiated a resolution on the basis that Ontario and Quebec were obliged to reimburse the Dominion for the augmented annuities and the parties quite reasonably decided to capitalize the future payments so that it wouldn't be an annual process of the Dominion going after Ontario and Quebec. So this comes to wrong number two. In capitalizing the future annuities. Number two, negotiating the resolution or capitalizing? Capitalizing, the way they capitalized. Now, you know, I, I call them wrongs. Well, they're they're wrong-headed. <laughs> they're they were following what they had to follow given what the court had said but but we can see now that these were wrong-headed solutions and uh, now that we understand um, the treaty as we do but it, it, it wasn't a wrong idea for the dominion ontario and quebec to say let's capitalize these annuities but the, the problem is how the annuities were capitalized the go the governments first of all the governments wrongly proceeded on a false understanding that the only obligation under the treaty was $4 per person, that anything beyond that was a matter of grace. And that was not from the JCPC. That was, no. had, they, they brought that to the JCPC themselves. Yes. It, it, you know, we saw that in the, the actual, uh, the very first award that's, that started the whole appeal process was the third award of 13 February, 1895, where the three arbitrators said, um, remember we went through that the, the amount is due to the tribes based on their numbers times $4. So all of the governments were then proceeding on the basis that this was a, uh, an annuity that was effectively $4. Anything beyond that was grace. And so the capitalization was based on this $4. Now, Canada, of course, you may remember the evidence that, in fact, Canada was paying $4 for every annuitant, even where, for example, in the Superior Territory, Ontario argued there, there weren't sufficient funds to permit increases. And Canada paid $4 per person, even though Ontario argued you're paying too many people, you have too broad a definition of, quote, Indian. Canada concedes it went ahead and it did not insist on capitalization of $4 for every annuitant it was then paying. And it did not insist on $4 for every annuitant it would have to pay in the future. And remember, this is because if it had so insisted, the capitalization couldn't have happened. Because in order for an amount to be capitalized, you have to have certainty as to what it's going to be, right? As to what the future you, obligation is going to be. When you say um, it did not insist on, or is it is it fair to say they negotiated a deal knowing that the capitalization would not fund all of the names on the list? Yes that they were using. Yes, that's a okay. fair way to characterize it. They capitalized it knowing that it wasn't a complete amount, but in my submission, and we make this point in our written argument, Canada did so to get the deal done. This had already been, remember, we're, we're 25 years past the increase in 1873. So Canada just wants to get the deal done. And as I mentioned before, Ontario was a hard bargainer. This was hard bargaining by Ontario. And at some point, I submit that um, Canada's actors just wanted to get the deal done. So yeah, 
Canada conceded that it didn't insist on capitalization for everybody that it was paying or everybody that it would pay, but that doesn't detract from the principle that under this theory of liability handed down by the JCPC, Ontario and Quebec were actually liable for these annuities. They were, when you say it doesn't detract from the principle, the principle existed, they negotiated a deal that's not necessarily fully consistent with the principle. That's right. It doesn't mean that Canada re rejected that that was the principle. This was a compromise. So when you say does not detract, doesn't demonstrate Canada saying we are giving up on that principle. Yes, that's a good way to put it. Thank you. So now I want to deal with how do we know that the governments thought they were dealing with a $4 per person obligation. I mentioned before that was the case in when they were dealing before the arbitrators and that carried through to the Supreme Court. But we know when the parties were talking about the capitalization and we're working that out, they had in mind, and I say the parties, I mean the governments, they had in mind that they were dealing with a $4 per person obligation. They recognized, at least some actors recognized, that it was subject to grace. But in terms of the mandatory obligation or, well, mandatory in the sense that if revenue is permitted, but the, the, uh, the firm obligation was up to $4 per person. And how do we know that? Here we need to look at the orders in council. The orders in council are in the compendium at tab 14. And we've reproduced all three orders in council. You may remember that Canada prepared the most complete order in council with a preamble and Ontario and Quebec followed with their own parallel orders in council, picking up the operative language. So those orders in council are, are, the relevant parts are also summarized in our written submissions at paragraph 404. I'm going to go through as I do at paragraph 404, a number of examples that demonstrate that all three parties were dealing with this understanding that it was a $4 annuity. The first is on page two of the order in council. Here I'm looking at the Canadian one, the Dominion one. At page two, it says, at the, at the beginning, in consideration of uh, what we're dealing here with is annuities of 2,000 per annum in respect of the superior Indians, et cetera, which sums were to be increased under certain circumstances and conditions set out in the treaties to an amount not to exceed $4 for each Indian. And Later, and, and first of all, I should have noted that starting at the beginning, the first page of the order in council, this is reflecting in the halfway through the very first paragraph, respecting the settlement of the disputed accounts of the Dominion and the provinces. So this is a settlement that the parties have reached. And you're looking at page one of the OIC? That's right. You're going to help me find that? Yeah, it's um, at the very first paragraph, it's like two thirds of the way down or halfway through respecting the settlement. Thank you. Yeah. So I just want to keep in mind here, this is a settlement between the parties. And this is why Ontario and Quebec enact parallel orders in council. In council. This was reflecting a settlement. And you may remember that, um, you know, one of the factors that there was back and forth in the correspondence 
between council for the Dominion and Ontario and even Quebec. And one of those issues was, what is the appropriate interest rate for capitalization? You may remember going through that. So this was very much a back and forth negotiated settlement. But ultimately the parties agreed as set out in the order in council that they were dealing with an annuity based on $4 per person. And that is clear from, as I said on page two, the first phrase I, I noted at the end of the first paragraph on page two, it's repeated again later on page two, when it says in the second full paragraph toward the bottom of the page, the Indians, am I reading from the right? The Indians represented, yes, the Indians represented that the land ceded were producing sufficient revenue to justify the payment of the increased annuities up to the amount of $4 per Indian. It goes on to say, and thereafter the dominion is paid the, the $4. So then we see the same thing on paragraph on page three The arbitrators, such steps have been taken that the arbitrators are now in a position to make their awards as to the amount to be paid to the Dominion by the government of the provinces of Ontario and Quebec for arrears and increased annuities. And it provides the amounts to be charged And it is clear that what's being referred to here is $4 per person because these amounts to be charged are very uh, clearly calculated and agreed upon by the three governments based on, calc based on multiplying $4 by the population of the First Nations at the time. That's where these figures come from. They, they're, they're $4, yeah. No, I'm sorry, this isn't the capitalized amount here. Here, this is the, the uh, arrears. So the arrears themselves were based on $4 per person. And we can go through, I didn't include them in the brief, but I don't think my friends will take any issue with it. These numbers were calculated on the basis of $4 per member of the population. But then furthermore, um, before we skip to that, there's one other reference on page three that I want to point out, which is that the order in council noted that Canada had continued to pay the First Nations the said increased annuities, which could only have referred to $4 per person since that is what Canada had been paying. So that last paragraph, when we say that since the 31st day of December, 1892, the Dominion government has continued to pay the said increased annuities, the said increased annuities is referring to $4 per person. We know that because on the previous page, we already went through it. It says the Dominion has paid to each of the Indians the sum of $4. So if you're following along with paragraph 404 of our written submissions, I'm going through these different um, points and we're now on point E, the fifth point. This is where we get to the capitalized amount, where the capitalized amount of $205,000 for both treaties combined was also very clearly based on $4 per person. These calculations are based on $4 per person. And the capitalized amount at page four I've got to find it, I'm sorry, I didn't highlight it. Here we go. The first paragraph. It says that um, the 2005, 
$205,000, it says, um, should be, well, it starts with, um, these are such long sentences, it's hard to know where to begin. The increased annuities payable to the Indians under the terms of the said treaties, and that in order to carry these suggestions out, an annual sum should be capitalized, sufficient to satisfy the amounts payable by the provinces of Ontario and Quebec in respect of the said increased annuities and the capitalization charge sum charged to the provinces, province of Canada account. So again, we're referring here to the said increased annuities, and that's a direct reference to the $205,000 capitalization amount, which was calculated on the basis of $4 per person. And the evidence of both Ms. Jones and Professor Messamore explains that calculation. And finally, finally, I note that um, after setting out that the capitalization amount of uh, would be $205,000, the order and council goes on to say, Again, I should have highlighted this. It's, this is on the last page. After setting out the party's calculations in detail, all clearly based on $4 per person, the orders and council specified that the capitalization amount of $205,000 would be, and here we're at the very top of the, the last page, it says the capitalized sum of $205,000 shall be taken to extinguish, it's the fourth line down, taken to extinguish forever thereafter the annual charge of $8,200 for and in respect of the annual claims of the Dominion on behalf of the Indians for increased annuities. So the charge that is being forever thereafter extinguished is in respect of the $8,200 representing the um, increased the increased annuities how, as they were understood at the time. And remember, how do we calculate that eight thousand two hundred dollars? Well, it's based on the population the parties agreed to at the time, which you may remember in the evidence there was dispute about this. Ultimately, Canada cut their numbers down, backed out twenty percent, cut it further. We ended up with two thousand six hundred and fifty Indians, and these were actually only from the Huron Territory, but Canada had given up really on pursuing Ontario for the um, numbers for the superiors, said, look, you know, we want to settle this thing. We'll just take the numbers that Ontario is prepared to agree to. That's 2,650. If you take 2,650 and multiply that by $4, you will arrive at $10,600. But you have to remember that $4,400 was already capitalized back in 1870 by the payment of 88,000. So if you take the 10,600, which again is the number of First Nations individuals times $4, back out the 4,400 already capitalized, the, cap the, amount, the, cap the amount that needed to be generated annually from the capitalization was $8,200. And I just point this out to emphasize, Justice Hennessy, that all of these calculations were based on an understanding that the parties were dealing with $4 per person and that the said increased annuities were increases up to $4 per person. The debate is not that it was based on $4, is it? Isn't the way Ontario frames the debate that, but, on t but Canada knew it was giving up on uh, a possible obligation that it, or, or uh, some, I don't know if the word is obligation, that a uh, potential increase. Yes. That, that's the debate. So it's not, these numbers are not in debate that they were based on $4, just that what can, if, if I am correct, 
that on Ontario's argument is that Canada was giving up on an increase, whether by grace or any other uh, mechanism, an increase past four dollars. And this is where I I would do I have that right that that's the debate. Uh, I would frame it differently. I, okay. I, I certainly have been focusing on the fact that the parties were fixed on this idea that it was $4. But what really comes out of that is the parties were fixed on the idea that $4 was the mandatory obligation, that anything beyond that was grace. And I think my friends, even in cross-examination, I think we, we saw a document in which I think it was Hogg, you know, making submissions, or maybe it was Robinson making submissions before probably the arbitrators on this issue and said, well, yeah, yeah, I have to concede that if it's, if anything beyond $4 is a matter of grace, then it may be the dominion that needs to exercise that grace. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, that was a submission by council, well, not a finding, but a submission by council, but anything beyond that, you know, the dominion would have to exercise. But we know today that the increases beyond $4 are not a matter of grace. They, the, we now know increases beyond $4 are mandatory. It's a mandatory obligation to increase beyond $4. And that's why I'm, I'm taking you to these provisions of the order and council. And, and you're right, I've, I've kind of probably misfocused the point on, look, we all agreed it was $4. What I really should be focusing on is we all agreed that this was the mandatory obligation. And now we know that no, $4 is not the mandatory obligation. The mandatory obligation has no cap. And that's where you see the distinction. All the parties are assuming there's a $4 cap here, but now we know there is no cap. And it's not appropriate to say, well, the Dominion, you assume that liability. You assumed the liability for the mandatory obligation before, beyond $4. No, the parties are very clear. The Dominion is assuming the obligation of the said increased annuities, which were clearly $4 in everybody's mind. This is a separate issue as to whether the Dominion may have graciously taken on other obligations. For example, if the Dominion had graciously decided on its own accord to increase beyond $4, or if, as we have seen, the Dominion graciously decided to pay the superior First Nations even though Ontario said they didn't have sufficient revenues, or the Dominion graciously decided to pay people that Ontario didn't agree. Sorry, you're saying this is a different issue from a, a possible 18 or a 1900 decision by Canada to increase annuities over $4. I, I was missing your point. Uh, a different issue than uh, the difference is the mandatory obligation versus the matter of graciousness. And I'm saying that these orders in council are agreed upon between the parties on the basis that the mandatory obligation is $4. And I, I acknowledge that in some ways, the history will show that Canada exercised some grace, in fact, did exercise some grace, and arguably could have exercised more grace in increasing beyond $4, but that would have been a matter of grace. In terms of legal responsibility, by agreeing to this capitalization, these orders in council, does not make the Dominion take on the mandatory obligation beyond $4, because the mandatory obligation, as it was expressed in these orders in council, was only $4. Have I made that clear? Thank you. You're saying that any exercise of grace by Canada did not change the legal obligation. Yes, and in fact, that's how I tried to articulate it in the written submissions. I think we finished our written submissions by saying there are a number of examples where Canada, in my submission, showed honor in, for example, paying the superior First Nations, even though Ontario and Quebec had not capitalized amount for that, or in paying taking a broader view of who was a treaty beneficiary than the capitalization amount had provided for. There were a few examples where, where Canada um, potentially showed some grace. 
But that doesn't mean Canada's uh, demonstrations of grace were not an legal acknowledgement of their liability to pay beyond $4 per person because everybody's understanding at the time was that the mandatory obligation was only $4 per person. And anything beyond that was a matter of grace. Would this be a good time to break? Uh, yes, and I'm happy to say that I'm almost done my submissions. I won't be that much longer, and then we'll be uh, fortunate to hear from my colleague, Ms. Crew. Very good. And we're back. It's uh, two o'clock. This court is to down until 2 p.m.